uh, Kirby's like, Stan Lee doesn't know anything about mutations. <laughs> <laughs>
at this stage. And I think that's telling because I feel like, again, there's so much of this stuff from the 90s that we look at that is exactly accurate today. You look at the racks of new comics today, and it's if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not experienced, you can't make heads or tails of, of like Marvel's publishing slate. And Gary Groth was calling it in 1990, and, and who knows, maybe before, but it's definitely in this issue. Then there's a really nice article on Calvin and Hobbes, Bloom County, and Farside, which is... Uh, I've been enjoying our, our look at some of these comic strips lately, and it's really cool to see that. And, you know, it's, they're glowing reviews, but they kind of talk about the virtues of, of each of those strips. I anticipate us doing some uh, some far side coverage in in the future. And if any kayfabers out there know of, like, the quintessential Gary Larson uh, interview, point us in a direction, man, so that we could get some words from, from the man's mouth himself rather than just using... Uh, uh, conjecture and anecdotal stuff, man. Speaking of which, man, we have the Jack Kirby interview conducted over the course of like three sessions by the Double G, Gary Groth, my fair publisher from Fantagraphics, and we're going to get some words from the man himself, and sitting in, riding shotgun with Jack, is Roz Kirby, and uh, they're, as you read this interview, man, they are in a neck and neck race for who could be kind of like the most charming. <laughs> it is nice. And, and they do have, uh, they fill in each other's uh, gaps a little bit. You know, Roz seems to be a little more conscious of the dates. I think she may have been the bookkeeper in the family. And so uh, is able to fill in certain details that for Kirby are a little more, uh, less clear, you know. And that's something that comes across in this interview, Ed, is thinking about this. And it's not in the interview per se, but just reading it and thinking about it. This is 50 years of a storyteller. Like, imagine trying to untangle that in your head and keeping things straight. You know how you get a million ideas and you throw a couple out and you use the couple somewhere else. I have trouble remembering my couple of books. I can't imagine sorting through these details of what, what must be must have gone through his head in those 50 years of making comics. A lot of good stuff in here and a lot of telling stuff sort of about the man. Uh, for instance, these first couple of pages, it's all about him growing up in the Lower East Side, having to fend for himself, um, his mom doing him sort of no favors, dressing his brother up <laughs> like a damn fool in, in frilly clothes and like a little sailor helmet, <laughs> sailor hat and stuff. And he had to, you know, to fight and defend his brother and all this shit. And it made me think about, um, like, you know, Kirby is, we call it superhero comics, it's like male power fantasies and all of that. All of that. Repeatedly in this interview, he talks about his small stature, and uh, there's all this fighting, there's all this bravado, um, war is involved, and uh, it's like, not only did he create the superhero, but it's like the male power fantasy part of it is, it, like, he was living that. I was going to say, he lives that gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. his character is uh, consistent with what you see in those, especially the superhero comics, very consistent with the interview. Some really, really good, like... I, you know, my, my grandparents, man, my grandfathers, they, they've been gone for a while, man. But like reading this thing, it made me, it made me think about them in, in the way that they tell stories. Um, and some of like the old timey language that, that's like so fun to me. For instance, when Gary asks them about like the, the kids in, in town, in the neighborhood, um, did everybody grow up in, involved in like some sort of black market or whatever? And uh, Kirby says something like, uh, uh, kids would grow up to be gangsters depending on how fast they wanted to own a suit. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, when they were talking about when the comic book first comes around and uh, like who, who the audience is for that, Kirby says that uh, like, it's, it's uh, you know, the respectable people, the res respectable men, they would read like Collier, Saturday Evening Post, novels. Um, but when you would look at a man or a person who's reading comic books, they're the kind of guys who shoot pull, he says. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of that sprinkled yes. through, throughout that is just, it makes you love him, man. It's great. And when he's talking about all the fighting and stuff, he refers more than once to uh, like rooftop fights of like running up and down the and, and fighting up and down the fire escapes onto rooftops and like jumping from rooftop to rooftops it's an amazing picture and and i'm an asshole and think parkour or something right but like you know he did that one streetwise comic that i would love right to now. see more auto bio of like 
let's see these running around, uh, you know, big fights on rooftops and stuff like pretty amazing. And, and that stuff does kind of get into comics. You know, that is a part of the comics uh, visual lore. So this pretty is, neat. This is the piece of the street code, uh, two page spread. And uh, in a conversation recently on a read more comics episode, we we're talking about the composition of crowd scenes and like, how do you do that? And, and this came to mind in basically everybody's mind at the same time because it's like there's so much going on it's chaos but it still is designed really beautifully man and you can't get here if you haven't done 50 years of drawing yeah and this is a great piece because like the perspective it's not accurate in in a specific way but it adds to that chaos it's almost cubism or something where like as you're looking at different parts of this image it makes sense on its own plane. Yeah. And the overall effect then when you're looking at the two page spread is that sense of chaos because it's almost movement. I've seen other art that does that a little bit where it's like the perspective is shifting as you look at the piece, even though it's one more or less one big illustration. And uh, it's a good way to create like that dynamic sense of depth, movement, life, all those qualities that a good crowd scene has because a crowd scene is chaotic and alive and moving and hard to take in and you know from any one point yeah for sure and this piece was drawn in the 80s the super early 80s gary asks him about it why haven't you done more uh mm -hmm. more autobio stuff and he kirby is kind of like well i try to put myself in all all of the work to various degrees i guess i guess we'll say man yeah he he comes back to that theme several times in regards to who writes a lot of his comics, you know, he says he always writes all of his comics, regardless if he's given a script or not, he's doing it himself because he doesn't want it to be contrived. Right. And because there is like a truth and an honesty about the stories that he tells, which I think gets back to that idea of like, a, you know, part of him and his point of view. Yeah. Specifically, he says, uh, DC Comics contrives, I create, he yes. says. And uh, going along with like the rooftop fights, um, the gangsters, all of that stuff. There is so much beautiful hyperbole throughout this thing. When he talks about courting Roz, because like it, it's this like building thing. He talks about courting Roz and how there were like five guys who were vying for her attention, and and one guy he he says something like the one guy got the picture, man. I, I he, <laughs> he was a piano player, man, and 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 I, I said uh, it would be a shame if your fingers got smashed by the by that little. Uh, case or whatever you should be in california you know these guys are all growing up in new york you should be in california you should be in the pictures man and kirby's <laughs> like kirby's like he got the picture there and then raj chimes in let's talk about like their first date and she says yeah he invited me up to his room to like look at his etchings and i was very exciting to go and then he really showed me etchings <laughs> <laughs> yeah those two are really fun together yeah there's, there's a lot of back and forth sprinkled throughout this interview. One of the things I found frustrating in this interview is Kirby doesn't always seem to grasp certain questions or what Groth is after. So we'll see questions repeated and, and somewhat frustrating answers, which is sometimes whenever Roz, you know, chimes in or helps to clarify what, you know, what she thinks Groth is after in some instances. Um, so that was one of the parts reading through this that kind of stood out to me as being like, I don't think he's avoiding any questions because there's also an interview with Joe Simon in this issue who had, I guess his autobiography was coming out around this time. And there were like 20 questions that Joe Simon was like, I can't, I can't tell you that because it's in the book. That's not what Jack Kirby's doing here, but there does seem to be parts where it's like, he's trying to tell his story, his way, I think is part of it. And some of it's probably language, you know, it's, it's generation or two between Gary Groth and Jack Kirby here. And, and that comes across now and then. The the uh, sort of illuminating thing with these interviews um, is that it is kind of evidence to what a lot of people said about even 60s Kirby whenever like the college kids started um promoting the comics, word of mouth grew, different audiences developed and um and Stan Lee was the breakout figure. The interviews would happen with like a Rolling Stone or a New York Times, and they would talk with Stan Lee, and they would talk with Jack Kirby, and he was kind of muttering then. You know, he wasn't able to create sound bites. He wasn't that kind of guy, and he always had somebody work in those angles for him. Originally, Joe Simon and then uh, ultimately Stan Lee. But obviously those are the guys who get to create the story. And, you know, he's the talent that, that kind of builds the, builds the thing. It's a lesson. You gotta, you gotta be your own advocate. And that's another thing that comes across in this interview in a big way is uh, not only would he kind of not speak up and, and, and cogently 
handle interview questions, like even in the past, but he wasn't a self-advocate when it came to getting, getting paid. Um, whenever he talks about the bravado and fighting and all of that, it's with everybody, but the person who's in the position to, uh, help, help give, give him a better life. And that's another piece that comes up in the interview very often is he talks about the cast system of publishing the publishers at the top and he's living his lifestyle and, and he's he's patting you on the head saying hey jackie boy you doing okay and when you're about to give the answer he just keeps walking right. <laughs> um the editor is you know they're they're taking you know two hour lunches and they feel like they have to be uh, a, a, a dictator in order to, to earn their pay and then you know the lowest like scum of the earth and like he almost says it in those terms um, is the artist, the creative, the person who makes the whole thing run is uh, looked at with far less than fondness, we'll say. Yeah. I love some of the history that they go through, too. Um, you know, like he, he goes, newspaper features very early on at a very kind of a small syndicate, you know, nothing nothing major, but obviously the strips were kind of the big, the top of the comics pile at this point. Did a little bit there. Worked at the Fleischer Studios, uh, anima early animation studio, doing as an in-betweener on Betty Boop and Popeye. Um, Victor Fox was one of the early publishers, uh, packagers of comics. Worked in that studio, Ego, Eager and Eisner Studio. Iger? Iger. Iger and Eisner Studio did, a, did some time there. You know, like, this is comics history, man, in America. Like... He was there at all these stops. And then, of course, joins up with Joe Simon when they start making comics together and packaging them. This is all pre-World War II. You know, like, this is Golden Age comics and, and Kirby there from the beginning. Sites like movie influences, things like Chaplin and, and uh, Marx Brothers. The Marx Brothers thing, uh, my little note on there is hanging out with Farrell Dalrymple. He was one of the guys that was into the Marx Brothers movies uh, early on, you know, like people I knew and stuff. And I, so I think that's fun to, to think a cartoonist recognizing that stuff. Obviously, Dave Sim, a big Marx Brothers guy. Um, you know, I think that physical comedy and character, body language, all of that stuff appeals to cartoonists. And, and it's cool to see Kirby single out some of these. When he's when he's talking about that, that hierarchy of the publishers and all that, uh, he mentions Superman and how Superman was the paradigm shift that that made com the comic book like the more viable thing and he's just he was like it was two boys from cleveland who made that who created who created an empire um and he recognized that but he never like sort of sort of prospered from the shit and you mentioned before world war ii captain america was created before world war ii and it was a hit he was a superstar in comics and we cover more interviews over time. We cover some of the Will Eisner shop talk interviews and stuff. You will see that, um, the cartoonists of the day, uh, recognize Kirby's talents far before 1961 when Fantastic right. Four was created. He, um, cites a few of the influences when it came to the comic strips and he, and he paints a really nice picture about his earliest kind of indoctrination with like magical thinking with the pulps and stuff. He saw like a pulp magazine in the gutter and brought it home. First time he saw a spaceship and the comics, uh, the comic strips, they existed when he was a little boy and Barney Google was a strippy dog. Um, he was young enough to read even like Milk Caniff strips that were, that were uh, in the paper and, uh, how Foster of course was an early influence on, uh, on young Jack Kirby. Yeah, and in terms of influence, Gary Groth tries a couple of rounds of questions about how did he learn to draw. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is one of those questions that it seems like it's not exactly the way Kirby thinks, you know, maybe talking process to that degree. But ultimately, the way he describes it is instinctually. So I'm sure taking in all of these influences that you're describing, Ed, these, these different comic strips and things, but instinctually is how he kind of uh, credits that, his learning to draw, and I think whenever you trace through that early, the jobs that he had, that's what you see is sort of like this talent who's working hard and just drawing, you know, and, and working his way through and up. And, and it may be part of why he didn't capitalize exactly on on his ability, you know, because it is, I think if, if you come in as self-taught, you're really, look, you're, you're being pulled in a lot of directions trying to figure this out, trying to get better, concentrating on, you know, the craft in a lot of ways and maybe missing out on other elements that, might serve you well over time, but maybe you don't have time for that as you're like trying to break in, trying to get jobs, you know, and it's, it's, it's com it's competitive. It's all freelance kind of work for the most part. Can we get into uh, a little bit about his, his wartime man? Cause there's some stuff there. Yeah, man. Can, yes. The, uh, 
the, the note that I have is he hit Normandy, yes. Omaha Beach, 10 days after the invasion. Bodies, according to this interview, still piled up on the beach. Imagine that as like a first impression. It's, it's you're, you're, you're walking into hell. You're getting off this boat and you're walking into hell. Um, before that part, like just when he's going to boot camp and all of that, it made me think about like, just like the context of the time, like how, you know, few people had automobiles and stuff. And he mentions like, I was with people from Texas. Like I never saw a person from Texas. Like I've never been anywhere. You know, I went to Georgia once and, but like, so I'm in a truck with people who I don't even know. And it's like, of course. Yeah. Of course, like, like, sure, a person wouldn't get far out from their town, even in the, the 20s, 30s, 40s, man. Of course. And I guess I just never thought about that. Yeah, I, it's a good point, Ed. I had the same kind of reaction when I was reading this and thinking about that kind of like, oh, yeah, you have one representation of a, of a Texan <laughs> right. or whatever. And it's a, you know, you're at boot, boot camp. Like, this is going to be a big, loud, boisterous. Everybody would have been sort of the alpha versions or at least putting on that front. And so whenever you see some of his team books from like Boy Commandos to even when he's doing the Losers decades later, I can kind of see where he's getting these like, OK, you, you give the character this tra a trait. And that's sort of their defining trait and you run with it, you know, and you and you say where he's from and some stereotype or maybe something he saw firsthand with a guy he knew from Texas. But it still comes off as this like oversimplified caricatures. Uh, but it makes sense to me that that's how you would build a team. You know, if you wanted to have these this team of different personalities, it kind of really makes sense based on the description he has of going into the military and what he's seeing and experiencing there. Uh, he was established in comics before he went. So when he was over there, it's not like he was the only uh, cartoonist or person involved in comics who was a part of the war effort in, in a real way. So uh, poor bastard gets trench foot. Severe trench foot. And he's talking about, uh, he has this one piece in here that's real good, where uh, there, are, there are other guys who had severe trench foot. Their, their legs turned black uh, and their legs fell off, as, as he calls it. Um, and he said that my legs were a dark purple. So what happens to that? <laughs> like, like what, what do you do for dark purple legs? It's horrific, man. What a description. <laughs> and, and it's guys like uh, Mort Weisinger and I think maybe even Julie Schwartz. I forget who the other uh, DC person is who was over there, but they were in France. And he described, described them as like carousing and, and they stop off in the hospital part. They see Kirby. Hey, Kirby, what you doing, man? You should you should hang out with these ladies out here in France. They're amazing. And, <laughs> and, and uh, he's, he's, he's trying to play, play tough. Like, like he can't stand up. Yeah. You know what I mean? His legs aren't, aren't working, but those guys, and, and he paints the editors with a brush of just being laissez faire, not doing a like, you know, he Kirby's and his crew, they're doing the work. The editors are hanging out with French girls and, and eating cheese and stuff. It is, uh, it is such a consistent narrative that he has built around himself. And, you know, I, I refer to some of it as character, and it is a blurred line. I, you know, I think he's a pretty sincere guy. But in terms of writing his own stories, I have the note, you know, average readers could associate with Kirby stories, common man literature, uh, core of truth. And it all is also the way he presents his life stories. You know, it's kind of the same deal, that the way he views himself and the stories that he's making. Very consistent between those two things. You know, I can see... It's very cogent to think of that as being core of truth and realism. You know, he uses the real word realism, and it does line up with the way he describes his war experiences. It fits perfectly with the co with the comic stories that he then is making uh, subsequently. Uh, there is a great uh, video, very short video, with Kirby describing some of his, his war experience. If I remember, I'll put it in the comments. If not, a kayfaber will link it. Greg, Greg Theakston took the video and he's talking about uh you know this this nazi came at me he looked like a butcher what am i supposed to do i didn't know what to do my my sergeant hit me on the head with his helmet and said you got to take care of him and kirby says it was a fucking massacre he says it you know what i'm saying man and then it makes you think like okay uh this is both my grandparents man they were over there definitely had ptsd and it trickled down and affected all the kids all that um this is like exhibit A of like somebody almost admitting to their PTSD and what safer place to be than in your own, you know, crib, sitting at your drawing table in full control of that page, man. Why not just draw a hundred thousand of them and do nothing else? You know, like, I think that speaks a lot. Like that word experience, I think speaks a lot to, uh, to his, his, his fertile output 
uh, once he got his ass back, man. That's an interesting insight. Obviously, I have no knowledge of war and can only imagine how horrific it is, but that makes a lot of sense that that idea of like you find that space, you know, you maybe seek out that space, that, that, that place where you feel safe or whatever and can just... I don't know, carry on. I bet you appreciate it, you know, in, in, in ways that we never will, hopefully. Right. Uh, but, but that is an interesting way to, to think about what he did and how he approached making comics from that point on. Gary Groth gets some good I- insight into how the, the studio system worked a little bit and how um, whenever they would create new titles, like, like how that worked with the different publishers, um, some page rate stuff is is in here and you know it varies throughout of course man inflation all of that man but uh it seems to be not far different than what we have uh today you know sometimes you would work out four or five pages show it to the publisher um thumbs up thumbs down you want it or not uh sometimes with the eisner Iger studios they would uh do a complete package and then shop it around um other times they would put the capital down themselves, publish the books on their own, man. Uh, when, when you create a genre, and, and Kirby's responsible for creating several genres, like did the first Westerns, boys comics, and romance, you got to publish those yourself. Like if, if, if a publisher can't point to something and know that it's going to make them money, sometimes you got to bite that bullet, and, and, and they made those moves. Yeah, and there's some, there's some weird... Th- this is one of the inconsistencies in this interview, especially compared to the Joe Simon interview, when it comes to the books that they published themselves, like Young Romance, they published themselves. Mm-hmm. And it was huge, selling over a million copies a month. Right. So they were in line for profit sharing, essentially. And, you know, like, Kirby doesn't really describe this as being an affluent period exactly. He says he says that they had to close shop because, like, they didn't have money. And, and it, it made me nervous. It made me scared. Like, it's like... Is Kirby being kept out of that those profits yeah, too? Yeah, I wonder about it because, you know, in the Joe Simon interview, he says, you know, they were clearing over $1,000 a week on those books, you know, as their profit share, which was a lot of money in, in a time when, when guys were making, you know... Somebody like, now would be happy to make $1,000 yeah, bucks yeah, a, a week. Yeah, there you go. Um, but, like, you know, the artist under them, because they also had other artists that were working for them, you know, as part of their packaging these books and stuff, were not sharing in that profit share. So they were acting essentially as publishers the way you know the publishing system has been set up in comics forever but there does seem to be some discrepancy between the kirby story and the simon story in regards to these titles that they published themselves that were these massive massive titles and super important and ed you mentioned you know inventing these different genres there's some really cool stuff that that i gleaned from this where like the early days of comics nobody really knew exactly what to do so part of the reason there's uh, you know, boy commandos, or there's westerns, or there's romance comics, is it's like, what do we do? Let's try this. Let's try this. And, you know, as a result, Kirby really did pioneer several of these genres early on, and things like the romance comics skyrocket. And he talks about, you know, there were romance movies that were successful, and romance books, and pulps, and all these different romance things. Why not romance comics? And you, he was right. Yeah, you go, he describes going to the newsstand and seeing all this romance stuff. You know, little pocketbooks, Harlequin romance, magazines, all of that. But no comics. Like, why, like, why the heck not? And and it caught on. And there's a lot of, uh, I can't remember if it's in this interview or if it's in some other features in this issue, but they talk about the Kirby romance comics and the interesting choice of Kirby doesn't change his style for any genre. You might not think Kirby would work, Kirby's style would work in romance, and it does fine, but also, like, it never stops being Kirby. And it's really interesting to me. It makes me think about style because... I tend to think of style as like, change the style to fit the story. Not everybody thinks that way. And, you know, it's hard to argue with the results that that Kirby, uh, you know, achieves. And so now I'm stuck thinking about that in my own work and trying to figure it out. But it it is cool that he did these romance comics and did them so successfully. It's a genre that I appreciate and like, and I don't think is always associated with Kirby, but makes perfect sense the way he lays out its origins. Talks a bit about, you know, Sky Masters. Yes. Um, you know, as, as comics start to dip and he's doing some of the Sky Master stuff, which was a daily strip that he did for three 300 papers, and I think it was two or three years that he produced this. That seems significant and successful. I'm, You know, like, these are the questions that I have after reading this interview, is I'm not sure if it was in 300 papers, you know, for a couple years, like, why does it not, why does it go away? 
And there's really weird stories about how this is done. So it's yeah. inked by the Wood Brothers. And to, so not Wally Wood, right? It's, it's these two other brothers. But then Wally Wood inks a couple of weeks worth. So it's just enough to really confuse the issue. So you yeah. think Wally Wood when you see Wood. And he does a few, but mostly it's unrelated Woods. You know what fucks me up? I thought that uh, I thought the Wood Brothers were, were writers. Ah, interesting. No, no, like I'm re- looking right here. Yeah, he inked a few weeks of them. Right. So, so it, I guess it was the, the the Wood Brothers. But it seems like the part of the reason, according to this interview, that this strip goes away is he dealt with the Wood Brothers through their mother, and would it was hard to get hold of them at times or to get you know the work to them or whatever. It's just bizarre and doesn't make sense. I can't understand it, and I'm sure there's more information out there somewhere because. It's beautiful, and there have been some really nice collections of the Skymaster strips, and I would encourage anybody to give them a look because they are beautiful. I was shocked to learn that Wally Wood's not more involved in them because the inking is so nice, and it does look like him. Uh, and it's the same last name. Very confusing. Everything about Skymaster is <laughs> very confusing, but he, great looking. He bounces, of course, through through basically every publisher that, that is around at, uh, during the, during that time, with the exception of, of EC, man. Uh Fighting American comes up and he talks about that as like that's that's like his first like you know superhero satire. He's making fun of uh, Captain America, and uh, and he's talking about like you know when you do a satire uh, of like a Captain America, that's where I could get characters like Uncle Samurai, and, he, and, he, and he's very happy with that. And so Me am too. I. <laughs> I loved fighting Fighting American. This is around whenever I'm reading uh, you know reading comics early on. And trying to figure all this stuff out. Fighting American sounds cool and looks cool. And it's Kirby. And they did a, a nice collection of this stuff around this time in the early 90s. So that may be related to this uh, Joe Simon, you know, inter- like it's all it's sort of timed perfectly. But there was a little bit of a Fighting American resurgence here. And then a couple years after this, of course, Rob Liefeld gets thrown off Captain America at Marvel. Licensed Fighting American, I guess, from Joe Simon and, and Kirby. I don't know if they both kept, you know, if it was both of those guys owned, still own the character. Um, you know, and then did some fighting American comics. Yes, yeah. I remember the Stephen Platt cover yes. in the uh, the Hero Illustrated insert, I believe. <laughs> kind of a fun and, and weird comic in a lot of ways like the Captain Americas visually. You know, Kirby goes through some of these style changes. Still looks like Kirby, but yeah. evolves Kirby. over time. Um, you know, these fighting Americans do resemble the, the first 10 issues of Captain America. I, I really like uh, the Simon Kirby, like tandem inking, like the, the weird, like soft faces that, that like... Ah, it's 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 real cool. The characters stuff. are a little more light. You know, it yeah. still has that dynamic quality, but they're these lighter characters that just seem like they are just moving, man. They are just constantly on you the move. Rubber figures. Yeah. And uh the way he, he pay, pays attention to to uh, like the drapery and clothes. Like he he becomes more mathematical about it uh later on, man, but everything about those Simon and Kirby things, man, is 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 beautiful to me. DC Comics goes goes over there. Jack Leibowitz uh, creates uh, Challengers of the Unknown. In a lot of ways, uh, almost a prototype for Fantastic Four. I would always associate, you know, when I would started reading Kirby and seeing interviews, is he would do, he would describe it as like, I think, 30 years into the future. Um, and it's not as far back then. Whenever he's doing Challengers, when he's doing Sky Masters, he's a couple years ahead of like the moonwalk, you know. So he's, he's well read in these like science and I don't, it's almost not quite science fiction, you know, but that he keeps up on that stuff to draw ideas out of and does seem to have like this almost prophetic eye and vision of that future. And it becomes more pronounced, I think, as he goes forward, like into his work in the 70s. But you see little bits of it here and there. And he does seem interested in those topics for story ideas. Now, we all know Kirby from his Marvel work, of course, essentially creating the Marvel Universe. And this is and this is where stuff gets really fun. And because any um se- any chance that Jack Kirby has to to mention that Stanley was crying or a nuisance or something, like it's in here multiple times, man. It's extremely critical of Stanley uh, from every angle, every regard, as a person, as a writer, as a creator. Uh, you know, propaganda, like it is very, very critical of Stan Lee. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the first, the first impression, first impressions are a big deal in life, man. And uh, you could hardly uh, escape from that chasm if, if you create a bad one, man. And, and Kirby describes the first time he saw Stan Lee, who's, who's probably five years younger than Jack Kirby, 
not a big deal between say you and I who are like five years different man but when Jack Kirby's like 21 uh you know delivering comics up at Marty Goodman's office and there's like you know a little kid playing an ocarina and dancing on desks <laughs> as uh as Jack describes here <laughs> You know, Jack Jack telling uh, Joe Simon to get that kid out of here so I could like work in peace. Um, that's you know you're in you you know you're in for a treat. The rest of the, you know twenty pages of this interview, man. <laughs> when that's the first impression that he had of Stanley, and he's very uh, happy to like tell you. Roz is very consistent with Kirby in this regard. You know, they talk. There, there's so much mystery and unknown. Before I read this interview, my thought is like. I don't care for this discussion because it's it's been hashed and rehashed and done so many times. But as you go through it, Kirby makes a very compelling case. You know, he has a long list of characters he created before he got to Marvel. Lots of characters created at Marvel. Lots more characters created after Marvel. What did Stan Lee do before and after Kirby? Right. You know, no characters created. So it's kind of damning. So he does mention that that Stan is a cousin of of uh, Martin Goodman. All of that, so he, he makes he sure does to, mention that. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. He he likes to get that nepotism angle in there, for sure. Describes um, Stan Lee as like a, a glorified office worker, man. Like I was handling the creative duties, and Stan Lee worked nine to five, and uh, was doing tasks for Martin Goodman. When we did the uh, Eric Reynolds shoot interview, and I asked, uh, did he get a quote from Stan Lee? For uh, around the the death of Kirby, Eric's like that would be a non-starter. Like Stanley was not would not talk to the journal, oh. and of course there's the get Kirby back his art campaign, which probably solidified that. But this this kind of shit don't help help either to those ends. Yeah, it seems like Kurt. Uh, there there are examples, and I think Groff pulls them out of Stanley being very gracious, you know, in regards to what he says about Kirby, um, which you know isn't enough for Kirby doesn't satisfy him in this interview. It's just a weird, you know, like I said, I thought I had an idea of how I felt about the Kirby Stanley collaboration, you know, that it was some kind of collaboration. Right. Mm -hmm. And you read this and it's like, man, it makes me reassess all of that, you know? And, and I wonder like th there's weird public opinion, you know, there's so much of this out there and I'm not that interested in getting into it and diving into it and starting any of this stuff. But it, it, it does paint a very one-sided picture and a very compelling, uh, you know, one-sided argument, I think. Right. There are, um, you know, Stan's, Stan's a good salesman, and we'll put the uh, the Thor artist edition under the microscope sometime. The, the real value of that is to see all the margin notes for the dialogue and stuff and to see how it changes. And Stan does bring energy. Stan, Stan he contributes. Like, those words... Those words matter, and, and those words resonated with me when I grew up, and they were different from what Kirby put down. Yeah, and you can see a lot of it in the uh, Kirby Collector because they reprint a lot of pencil pages, and you can really see Kirby's words and stuff in those if, if you wanted to then track down the printed comics and compare and contrast. And, you know, I think I think it's worth mentioning and, and going over again, Ed, what you say about Stanley being the salesman. Mm -hmm. Because we say it all the time on this channel is this idea of, like, it's not just making good comics. Like, you also have to be the, the salesman of those comics, the promoter of those comics. And Stanley definitely figured that piece out. Like, yeah. he was such an effective salesman for, for certainly through the 60s with Marvel and, and really connecting that to certain audiences and having them viewed a certain way as being this hip counterculture piece. I, I I don't know, you know, like, let's not undervalue that either of in course. this whole kind of debate because it is significant and it is important and it continues to be important today. And there are, you know, there are precedents for it. Like, I think the EC comics did some really interesting things in terms of selling and connecting to a community and building that loyal following. Stanley picked up, you know, picked up that baton and kept going. And if you compare, like, Marvel of this era to DC of this era, that's a big piece that the DC comics did not have was a way to frame and promote these comics so right. at the very least that i think is is pretty effective i mean That's we can look fun. at kirby and think like there are decades before and after marvel also and he didn't achieve the the, the renowned success that he does in this period so right. even if it's he's the creative and stan lee's the salesman that's a pretty amazing collaboration being a good editor is undervalued a lot because it's invisible and almost everything I like, like, say, 
the Howard Stern show or something, like the clips they play and how quick Stern will cut things off. It's like he's using an editorial, uh, I, like we're looking at this on an iPad and fucking Steve Jobs didn't invent any of this shit, but he put thumbs up, thumbs down in a way that created like a compelling thing that like resonated with co- the culture. Um, there's value in that for sure. For sure. And I've gone through phases where I think like a cartoonist I really like, let's say a Chris Ware, for example, that it's like what separates him from others is that ability to edit, yes. to, to recognize what works and what doesn't and where to cut it off. So definitely that is a huge, huge skill. Yeah. You see it in film, you know, I mean, like, like editing, that's one of the places where editing is kind of front and center and you get to see it. And that is a strong demonstration of like, cut it at the right moments, man. You know, like, like sh- retain the parts that are important that, that make this puzzle a masterpiece. And you, and you hear about all, like, all your favorite directors, they, they like, they keep their editor, you know, they work with their editor through their career. Um, but the editor doesn't give themselves a co-directing credit. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and therein lies our, our deal right here. Yeah. And then, of course, it gets into, you know, the murkier waters of this whole story becomes ownership and rights and things like that, which gets really dark. And this is another thing that comes up in the Joe Simon interview, because Joe Simon was fighting for the copyright of Captain America. And there are some like insinuations about Kirby's involvement in that yeah and Marvel doing some hoodwinking and manipulation themselves to sort of keep you know keep control of that copyright through Kirby's interest in that copyright and so it is you know it goes beyond just who created what in terms of like oh let's give credit or let me take some credit to things like legally now there are claims and in this case billions of dollars and legacies involved so that's part of the reason this becomes such a heated debate because it's not just oh who figured out you know who sold this comic it's a lot bigger you know i mean these are fam these are families corporations gigantic properties that are are being debated in this in that yes and and, and kirby like we talked about it in our captain marvel episode like months and months and months ago man probably a year ago where uh carl burgos was salty about um marvel reintroducing the Human Torch character into the Marvel Universe. Like, when you see those 60s Marvels and you see the reintroduction of Captain America and Namor the Submariner and the original Human Torch in, like, Fantastic Four number four, um, that wasn't necessarily... That wasn't creative decision. That was that was business decisions because the, of a impending lapse of copyright. You know what? That's a great point. And again, this comes up possibly in this one, but also in the Joe Simon interview in the same issue. And it's that they didn't, you know, why didn't they keep copyrights on everything? And and I think it's Joe Simon that says, we had no idea this stuff was going to be worth anything. You just didn't think that way. But some people did. Some right. of those lawyers, some of those publishers. And, you know, they may have just thought that way out of habit. Like, they may not have believed, like, we've got an empire we're building here, but just out of habit of, like, file that claim. It's, you know, there's a lawyer on payroll and earn your money or whatever. Um, you know, and and then like that works in the future, you know, in the future you go, that's the greatest thing ever. Like, look at it. It's worth billions of dollars now. But at the time, nobody was thinking that way. It's, it's, I get, I get sad reading this stuff when you think about how all of this stuff goes down. Sure. You know, I have tremendous amounts of work and genius creativity and, you know, p- putting your blood and sweat on those pages, but not having the foresight to recognize like, this could be valuable. You know, it's everybody's, everybody's. You can point to a dozen instances of like, where does this go wrong? What's the misstep? And it's like everybody has them, yeah, you sure. know, in these early stories, and it's it's tragic. Yeah, yeah. Bob Kane doesn't somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I think he had an uncle who was a lawyer or something like. That. I forget how. Yeah, that... yeah. He had some 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 uh, legal advisor there early on that was like a relative or something that really helped him a lot. Um, I just saw a thing, and I think it was like a Richard Petty, the race car driver comic that was drawn by ba- Bob Kane, creator of Batman. It's like on the cover. <laughs> that is so ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny, man. Um, I I would imagine the people who had the foresight back then, who would you point to? It would, it would probably be 
Walt Disney, right? Like, like uh, yeah. one of the early guys. And, and you know, that's a lot of the, the way the whole Kirby stuff ends up going. A lot of it is related to Disney, who had a lot of influence over copyright laws and how those things would be changed. And as the Kirby lawsuits continued, like they were moving towards the Supreme Court whenever they reached like the, the settlement recently with the family. So, you know, those were things where it was like that would have changed the world as we know it, depending on how it shook out. And, and companies like Disney, definitely, uh, you know, those companies are at the front of it now and have been for decades, uh, yeah. realized what they had and, and, you know, keep that control. Like, like that was important. And he was one of the early guys to recognize that. The copyright law stuff is, is very murky. It, it, it well, not murky. It's very clear, but it's, it's also very dangerous, like the culture, because yes. just even like art textbooks, I don't even think they could go up to Picasso now without getting licensed. They definitely can't with Jackson Pollock, like Jackson Pollock, like, their, his licensing fee, like for his estate or whatever, is like ridiculous, and and a lot of his works are like omitted from the texts and stuff. Where does that leave the culture? It, you know, it's one thousand dollar textbooks. What's the answer? Yeah, these are these are good points, Ed, and lots of people write about this stuff because it is relatively recent. That you know, it, it has changed how culture can develop, and it's a relative recent development. Back to the task. Yes, <laughs> one on the side. <laughs> But I mean, it's important to talk about like when when you you're talking Kirby, you gotta you gotta talk copyright. Yeah, it's hard not to. Talks um, Marvel method, and he describes it as like you know the phone conversation. He would go off, produce the entire uh, the entire thing, bring it into the office, and um, you know get a check sent to him the next month. Man, that comes up several times too. It seems like that's that's a good business relationship for him is they paid on time there wasn't a lot of hassle and that happens a couple times mm -hmm. uh, you know throughout this this article at different stops along the way yeah and then eventually like towards the end when he when he makes a comic that he actually owns and has the stake has stake in um now he has had, has to go chase his money yes. from pacific comics for uh captain victory and and uh what is it, silver star or right. some shit he has to go chase his money. He's a very proud old guy who is a le who built our business essentially when it comes to you know superhero comics, and now he has to like go chase his money. Yeah, it's it's it, again, it's such a tragedy. You know, you think like he's finally got to the point where he owns the work, but of course it can't work smoothly. You know, and 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 it's Roz that's chasing down those checks and talking about how uncomfortable that is, and it's it's just a shame. Like it never totally works out in this interview because. 92, 93, the creation of Image Comics, that Phantom Force comic that, you know, McFarlane and all those guys inked a page or two of, the royalties that brought into him were grand, grand, grand royalties. So, so it, the, the, there's a cherry on top and, That's and, nice. and, and, and we think about like, think about that, you know, like. That's wonderful because it is towards the end of his life and it had to feel good, you know, as, as he's getting older and, and, you know whatever struggles he was having there at the end of his life to get a large paycheck in. Because again, the thing that comes up every stop, you know, every publisher he works for is feeding his family, providing for his family. It's paramount. It's the number one goal of this man, his entire life, everything he describes, that is the number one piece. And so it's awesome. You're right. Ed, that is a nice cherry on top to be like towards the end. Here's a nice big check for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Now uh, with this particular interview, we cannot, move forward until we address like the one sort of memorable piece right here yeah about uh groth asking can i ask what your involvement in spider-man was kirby says you know i created spider-man we decided to give it to steve ditko i drew the first spider-man cover created the character created the costume created all those books and i couldn't do them all decided to give the book to steve ditko who is the right man for the job he did a wonderful job on that man Well, Ed, <laughs> what 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 do you say to that? Uh, I I mean I just don't know. I mean it, like we just read his words right there. You know what I'm saying? Steve Ditko has different words. I don't I. There it is. So depending on how you think Spider Man's creation went, because this is another subject that is written about all over the place. Yeah. And I guess Stanley has a version. Ditko has a version. Kirby, has, Kirby a version. has a version. Yeah. If you believe one of these other versions, then suddenly does it call into question the validity of this interview? Like, are we left with this idea of like, well, maybe 
maybe there's a lot of this might not be accurate. People in, like a fanboy is an idolater, like like uh, Kirby is God or Stan Lee is God or any of those, and uh, it's binary. And the culture's moving that way. Like you know, you're either fully with me or if you disagree with me, you hate me. Right. That kind of stuff. Um, by virtue of him even doing like the name or you know Captain America, Human Torch thing proves that he's not infallible. Sure. And uh, you know, right that right there. You know, another another mark, perhaps. He's a human being. Congratulations. Yeah, another mark. And then you start to think, well, what about some of Stan Lee's claims? Maybe he was writing a little bit more than than we give him credit for. That's fair. And 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 you look at the evidence. You look at the the Thor things, and he does. He does. He adds a lot. And 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 in terms of the dialogue. Now, the Marvel method to call yourself a writer. Yeah, I mean, we could get into that conversation. To call yourself a writer when you tell a guy, you know, draw, uh, they're going to fight the Green Goblin, have a water tower in there, <laughs> and now you go off and you pace it completely. You think the water tower is part of the pitch? I actually do. <laughs> I do. I think it's that, like, sort of insignificant. Yeah. And then, you know, you go off, you plot the whole thing out, pace it all out. That is writing. That is completely writing. Yeah, for sure. And then give it to this guy to like you fill up the negative space with dialogue. That's writing too, but that's a different kind of writing. Yeah, you know that what that is. That's uh, in in movies, that's like script doctor or like punching scripts or something. You know, like that ain't writer. It's very true, man. We think of that with film, like that's the writer or whatever. But there's so many hands involved. Yeah, it is. It is very hard to really assign that credit. And with comics, like part of the writing is done in the artwork. You know, even if those are fairly split, you know, if it's a very detailed script, part of the writing is still done in the artwork. Yeah. Yeah. You draw an expression, you draw, you know, things happening. <laughs> Gary will like bring up things very often. Like who created this? Who created that? Like literally like there's those fanboyish questions of like, well, who created this? Almost no, I've sort of like knowing that like Kirby, Kirby's eventually like, I created it. Okay. Question mark. Like, like there's a lot of that. In here, man, where, like Gary's just like, well, what about this? It's, uh, Me. it's Jack Nicholson on a stand and a few good men. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And, and, and Gary's uh, Tom Cruise in the gimmick. <laughs> it, it does reflect that frustration. You know, when I'm asking these questions now, decades later, we're st we still don't have answers to these things, not not definitively. Yeah. And and I think that reflects Gary's uh, going back to these questions. And, you know, it's, that's the journalist, right? You're just trying to get get as much information about this as we can. It is uh, fascinating to get like little glimpses into into Kirby's like writing process with with the Marvel books and how he wouldn't like plot ahead. And it would make perfect sense mm -hmm. if the guy's drawing 150 pages that month. Um, his philosophy with with putting these comics together, the way he describes it, is that um, you know I create a scenario, mm -hmm. I drop the character in the scenario, and try to think as best I can how to get the character moving through the scenario, how to conquer the obstacle. It, it, what would the character do in the situation? Yeah, he he describes it as realism, right? In, in, in terms of the character, right? Yeah. Like we we know the character, so what would they do? Um, pretty interesting. And, and like you said, it makes it up as he draws it, which I always admire. I, I think it does create a certain life on the page. And his his comics and characters do have that quality. So it is great to see him kind of talk through his thought process. I forget what I was watching where. Oh, you know what? It was it was a. Uh... It was uh, Robert Downey Jr. of all people on uh, Joe Rogan yes. talking about how uh, he and like these other guys like they they enjoy like writing themselves into a corner because then they have to like you know kick into high gear and try to figure out like use their intellect to try to like get the heck out of those situ situations, man. And uh, following those master classes, Dave Mamet, Aaron Sorkin, they all say the same thing: "Good, you got yourself into a tough spot. Awesome." This is where the this is when you become a writer. Yeah, for now, sure. Now get out of it. And that's related to this. Like, is it the artist or the writer who's doing what writing? Where you bring an actor in, and it's the same deal. Like they're bringing a lot to it. Yeah, you know, inventing it and figuring that part out. Look at this amazing cityscape, and it's this is New York, but mm -hmm. it ain't New York. Like, I love this shit, dude. Yeah, so much. Yeah, so it was page after page of like. You know the 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 Stanley uh, smear campaign gimmick man uh, a lot of crying. In fact, he create 
the part where Jack Kirby talks about like the initial part of making the books, Fantastic Four and all that, when he goes to the Marvel offices because he needed work and 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 like almost desperation, he goes there and he describes the movers bringing out the couches and, and, <laughs> and the desks from the Marvel offices and, and Stan Lee sitting there bawling, another, you know, Stan Lee crying moment. And Jack Kirby like, you know, puts his hand on Stan's shoulder and says, go into Uncle Marty's office Tell him to quit moving the furniture. I'm gonna make you some books, man. I'm, <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm determined to 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 sell sell you some books. Fantastic Four. He was, um, you know, post atomic bomb. Mutations were Mut a big big uh, topic in his mind. Atomic age, you know, like like that's a period in movies and all that stuff, man. So uh, let's bring that to uh, these comics, um, and getting some of the origin stuff of the specific characters is pretty fun when it comes to Kirby's answers because I could almost picture the Kirby crackle over his head when he talks about creating the character of of, uh, of the Incredible Hulk after seeing a mother <laughs> lift a car up. He tells this story a couple of times in this interview too. Yeah, yeah. there are a couple uh, parts where he, where he sort of says the same thing and I imagine that um, those are like the breaks like when Gary comes back in you know, because like, oh, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. done over over three three parts, and I imagine that that is where uh... it's the closest. I think he comes to that soundbite piece. Yeah, um, you know, like when we get a book done, and it's like, okay, now you've got to be able to summarize this book in in your smooth one sentence pitch, you know, in an interview or whatever. Yeah, and it feels like that description of the Hulk and where he gets the idea for the Hulk of the of the woman picking up the car off of their child. You know, it feels a little bit like that. Like this is probably an origin story that he has told hundreds of times you know it shows into fans and on panels and things and and kind of neat to see those stories it's so fun too man he, because he he um qualifies some of this stuff and like he's like no i'm not gonna say you won't get a hernia <laughs> but if you needed to i think you could lift the house <laughs> <laughs> i love it it's, it's, it's very it's, fun it's, it's, it's great storytelling it's magical thinking and what place better to use magical thinking than on the comic book page yeah and I've, I've this is my fourth time repeating this and i don't have the excuse of it being recorded over several sessions but it is that character you know like it is it is like it's part of the character that is jack kirby it is endearing you know and it is like keeping up the storytelling piece it's very fun and yeah. on point yeah and they just keep it going, man. How about this character? How about that character? Sergeant Fury, what was the deal there? Um, he talks about, you know, the genesis of that. And and uh, Roz chimes in, like, I was there when when Jack was creating the logo. So, so Stan Lee can't take credit for that either. <laughs> I do love their loyalty to each other. For sure. Um, even, like, with the Fantastic Four part, uh, Kirby's like, Stan Lee doesn't know anything about mutations. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that'd be a great t-shirt. <laughs> and then, and then, so like he'll he'll like straight name drop whenever he's dissing them. And then there are these parts where, and then there was a man who never wrote a a line in his life. He could hardly spell, taking credit for the writing. So like, then he'll get like, you know, he'll get like that. It's very, I mean, this is very, like, honest, like, to him, you know? Like, yeah. this, is, this is a very honest conversation, and I'm so glad we have it on the record. That previous page, the Captain America page, made me think, like, early on, he references growing up in all those fights in the, in the Lower East Side yeah. as being uh, another component of that realism and core of truth uh, in the fight scenes and stuff that he would build. You know, like, because he was in fights of four-on-one or five-on-one, when he would do a Captain America fight scene and Captain America's fighting ten guys, this is how it would go, you know? And it's it's funny. It's, it's it's again, it's endearing, but it's it's kind of funny to view this stuff and the idea that, you know, this is realistic, right. uh, you know, in some way. There was one other piece of process stuff, and I can't remember where in this interview it happens, yeah. where uh, he basically talks about doing a lot of work at night, you know, being a bit of a night owl. Mm -hmm. I always think that stuff's interesting and telling, you know. I, I think a lot of artists work at night. Ed, you've ob obviously talked a lot about having a, kind of a nighttime schedule being your preference, so I never knew that about Kirby, so kind of neat to see that. Just little bits, you know, these little bits of process stuff. Yeah. It's fun to get that sprinkled in. Kir Kirby gets so aggravated at, at just, like, the comic biz. Mm-hmm that he packs up the fam and they go to California 
And it's when he's out there that, uh, and also just like the, like thinking about that in context and how there's no social media, like none of that stuff, that seems ballsy. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you're Jack Kirby, cool. But how do people get in touch with you? Like when you have to get a new phone number, you can't keep the phone number right. that you had. Now you got to get a new, how do you get the word out? Plus yeah. like long distance was an actual, it costs money. Yeah. You know, it's not today where you can call anywhere in the world. And uh, and specifically, I'm thinking about like the work that he did, say, say Rankin, not Rankin Bass, Ruby Spears, mm -hmm. these California operations. Like, are there Kirby postcards that he put sent out as like a regular illustrator? Like, like, like how did these um, gigs gigs happen? That, that's that's something I'm curious about that we that we sort of never yeah, you don't get. see that here. Um, you know, there are stories of whenever he moved to California early on, having a barbecue with Alex Toth, yeah. one of my favorite comic stories. And so there was a contingent of comics artist in California who would do stuff for like Western. Right. Uh, but we're also working in animation. So I assume there's a bit of an informal network amongst these people. And certainly Kirby, I mean, everybody would have longed to to know him if they didn't already or be connected because of his influence and, and name recognition. So probably he shows up and it kind of buzzes through there, right? You know, the uh, whatever informal network of cartoonists that hung out with each other and artists it probably spread that way, is my guess. Makes sense, man. One guy who definitely wanted to do some work with Kirby was Carmine Infantino, publisher of DC Comics, man. And he came out to Cali, go go chill at the crib. For yeah, and, and so coinciding with Kirby's mounting frustration at New York and at Marvel, you know, part of the move, get away. Also part of the move, DC wants us. They're going to pay us well. They're going to give me an autonomy. Like, it's he's ready to make that jump. Yeah. Gets an inker out there, man, Mike Royer, West Coast dude, so he can look over the shoulder and, and uh, you know, put thumbs up, thumbs down to stuff. I saw a uh, a, common, a comment that showed up in the cartoonist kayfabe is, did Kirby poach Mike Royer from uh, Russ Manning? Yeah, I saw that. but I, I, I've never heard that or anything, and it's like, next time I see Mike Royer at a show or something, I'll be quick to ask him about it because now I'm curious, and yeah. it's not a story. I thought you might have some insight on that, but uh, yeah, not something not. I had heard before. I do not, but I it do It may know not Russ... be true. I don't know that to be the case. Yeah. Uh, so to, to start things off, when we get to the fourth world, Kirby asks Infantino, what is your, what is your turd book? What's your dog book? Another man? one of my favorite comic stories. This is legendary. Keep going. Yeah. And uh, they mentioned that it's, you know, Jimmy Olsen, you know, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Kirby's like, well, give me that one. I'll, I'll, I'll do something with that. And he does. Turns it into a seller, man. And then Infantino's like, well, what else you got? And Kirby's like, well, I have something else. And Infantino's like, well, how about four things? You know, like, is like, well, we could do 34 books. Is that good? And, uh, the fourth world begins, man. Yeah, and this is another muddled piece. This is something I've never understood about the fourth world. When I would start reading comics and hearing about this fourth world sort of considered didn't work, uh, failed or whatever, you know, and now we all look back and regard it as like, wow, this was this breakthrough work. In here, he talks about it being profitable, and yet it still gets canceled. And I can't totally understand that. How does that work? If it's profitable, why does it get canceled? Like, almost all something the... doesn't add up. Almost all the books, though, that that were canceled, were profitable. Um, but it's like they had they weren't profitable enough. And Marvel still kind of works oh, that okay. way. That, like that like, would make more like, sense. like everything makes money. It's just like about time equity and like shit like that. So I bet it was still selling hundreds of thousands, and I'm sure it was generating a profit. But was it generating enough profit? And I think that that's the case. Like almost none of these books ever lose with the machines that these guys created. You know, the, the biggest turd of, of Marvel is still going to, like, be in the black, but is it worth our time? Can we use those funds and try to generate something bigger? One other thing that comes up in this interview in regards to DC in, in this time period with Kirby is it seems like some people just are against him. You know, some of the editorial, some of the other, I don't know if they're freelancers, cartoonists, or what. It's almost like it's too weird or... You know, it's it's of a different generation or something. It just it, there's almost like a pushback. Not everybody seems to be behind him like Carmen Infantino. Yes, and even in mm -hmm. the introduction that Gary put in there, he talks about like the the uh, the discerning aesthetics uh, point of view of Kirby as being clunky and this and that, blah blah blah. And you you hear a lot of those stories, man. Um, they say that you know Carmen Infantino, the editors and and creatives in-house at DC were like, don't bring the Marvel guy here. And that's like precisely what 
Infantino wanted to like get get a little Marvel fla- flavor yeah. into, into the line. Yeah, Marvel's kicking our ass. Why wouldn't we bring that guy over here? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, that that speaks to the smallness of a lot of people though. Because here it is, Kirby gets to edit these books. What am what what about me? I'm an editor. What right. am I gonna do? Yeah. So, you know, some of that is self-serving, I'm sure. So there's that with DC. Then he comes back to Marvel and he's getting static in house Jack the Hack, this kind of thing. Um, because all those fucking fanboys just want him to do more Fantastic Four or like who cares about this eternal stuff, man? So can't win for losing. Yeah. And again, when I was a kid, Fourth World was viewed very differently than now. And it's such a visionary project that, that he brings to DC, which I think is noteworthy because, again, from a creative standpoint, like that dude's still throwing the, the fastball uh, at this point. You know, like he shows up, he gets autonomy. And what does he do? He he imagines, he, he envisions this new method of storytelling in comics that would stretch across several titles and be a gigantic epic that we have not seen before in comics. And part of it is because nobody else can write and draw several books, you know, to be able to keep something like this going. It's incredible. It's what a work. He, uh, in that Masters of Comic Art uh, VHS tape from the 80s, the one that Harlan Ellison spearheaded and, and hosted, uh, Kirby talks about like, you know, first we had the cartoon, you know, single panel. Then we added a couple squares and we had the comic strip. Then we added some pages that had the comic book. Where do we go from here? I like, it, like, so he, and this is after he did that silver surfer, a hundred pager. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was there for every step of the way. It's like Hitchcock, you know, just doing silent films all the way up to exploitation movies. Yeah. Like, like Kirby was there from the editorial cartoon to image comics. That's an interesting comparison. Ed. I just gave myself chills yes. actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, it rounds out. Are we still at DC? We done with that, man. Go back to, you know, does, does work at Marvel and, and Gary, Gary is like, you know, like, I'll be honest, I wasn't really feeling um, Eternals or, or Black Panther or any of that. And Shut up, Gary. 2001 is awesome. Oh, yeah, he does say 2001, <laughs> too. He does name it. Um, I, I like all that stuff. I do. I like a lot of that stuff as well. I like Devil Dinosaur. I'm, I'm a fan of that era. And, uh, and and Kirby was just like, you know, just going through the... And even Roz is like, yeah, just going through the motions. Like, you know, this is what we, you do. This is what I've been doing for 50 years. I have a note, Ed, that he's a uh, he's a cartoonist. He's not a penciler. Of course. And so, you know, we've talked about this a bit where I think that different jobs have sort of profiles, different occupations have certain personality profiles that go with them. And the difference with a cartoonist and a penciler is this like control and, you know, it's it's doing all of it and it's your vision and it is an auteur kind of autonomy kind of thing. And so I think as a result of having that type of personality where he's making the stories and the art and, and thinking of different formats and all of this stuff it's like his heart's been broken at every step. You know, every stop along the way has ended unhappily. And so you get to the end of this and it, you know, that's what you're seeing in this era that they're referring to is like, what, you know, what else can he do? He's getting older at this point and he's tried everything. As you say, you know, from the beginning to this point, it's like he has done everything and yet they all sort of end in heartbreak. Yeah. Now this, like I sometimes come. Conf- confuse uh some of the material that was in this interview with the will eisner um the the eisner interview had like one of the one of the toughest pieces to read about how um kirby like he couldn't allow himself to like go to go to certain stores and if he saw like merchandised marvel items imagine nowadays jesus christ um he like literally like it was like the death of a thousand paper cuts. Like he would see that stuff and just know like this is something he created that he doesn't prosper from in any way, shape, or form. And I mean, if you look at how the the stuff shook out, uh, you know, Kirby late nights drawing all these pages. Man, poor guy dies in nineteen ninety three. Stan Lee gets to live a real long, nice, nice old life, man. You know, uh, and this guy, this guy worked his ass off. This comes up over and over. You know, this this is the thing that he seems to want is like, let me do the comics I want to make. Stay the hell out of it. Yeah. I'm moving to California now so that you'll be further away and can't mess with it. And, it, you know, this is that cartoonist piece that I'm talking about. Yeah. And it just never quite works. He's yeah. never totally given that freedom. Read the quote. A lot of people have put their fingers in whatever I've done and tried to screw it up. And... You know, it is it is sad to read that. And it gets into certain, like, you know, when he went over to D.C. and it seemed like it was going to be this, like, bright new territory and he's working on Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, you know, he had a certain way that he drew uh, this swarthy Superman. 
that made uh, that made DC editorial bristle. So they like you know got Kurt Swan to draw over top of it or something, man. From the very beginning, yeah. From the very begin. As soon as he gets there and thinks this is my creative freedom, I get to do what I want here. And the first thing they do is paste ups over his his Superman heads. Yes, it just it it never quite works exactly. Yep. And at this point, the conversation ends with uh, Pacific Comics. Captain Victory, he got royalties. Uh, the direct market's in effect. But mentions that he has to chase down that loot. And, uh, you know, it's embarrassing to him and stuff, man. I, I, I get it. Uh, ultimately, G- Gary asks, like, as like one of the final questions, man, what was your most, uh, you know, creatively rewarding period? He's talking about, like, when he was, like, really firing on all cylinders with uh, New Gods, man. And uh, you read those books, you check those things out, man. You could tell he's having some fun. I think uh, at, whenever, you know, Chioli gets gets done with Kirby or, you know, whenever, we might have to put some of those fourth world gimmicks under the microscope and talk about those series. Um, I read them, uh, each of them once. Uh, I want to read them again. Yeah, I'm eager to do that as well. And DC has done a good job, I think, repackaging those in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Whenever they started packaging them up and... and putting them out like sort of in the sequence they were published in and stuff. And it would be great to go through them with somebody like Tom who knows them forwards and backwards and inside and out. And it is a great reflection of Kirby. Like when you think of his body of work, it makes sense that that is the stuff, the apex, because like all of his focus and creative energy spent, you know, a hundred pages a month or whatever he was creating with those books. It, it's kind of perfect for, you know, what we've seen in his in his body of work up to that point of just, like, bursting with creativity. Imagine if I focused it on one story. Right. Jim, uh, it was important to me that we have, like, a nice, long Kirby discussion, have a little bit of a deep dive in, into, into his brain a little bit. Um, this is the best way that I thought, you know, off the top of my head. Um, happy to do so. Happy to reread this. If kayfabers know of any other like really clutch, dope Kirby interviews, let us know in the comments. Another thing I want to solicit is uh, any other interesting, fun, great, unforgettable comics journal interviews. Let us know in the comments so that we can uh, dust off those issues. Take a look because with each of these pieces, man, we did the we did the McFarlane. We did the Kevin Eastman. We did the Bill Watterson. And this one's the Kirby. Man, that's like a Mount Rushmore you just named, Ed. I learned a lot of stuff from each of these, man. I learned far more from these things than I than I have with a lot of uh, my, my reading of, of late. And there are things in here that I'm directly able to apply to, to my practice uh, professionally, if not artistically on the page, man. So I look forward to doing more of these deep dives, man. Um, I don't know about you, man, but this is that's pretty much it for my notes, man. Yeah, that's it. Can we get out of here? Yeah. Kay Fabers, we are on the race to 15,000 subscribers. Uh, like, follow, and subscribe to the channel. Please hit the bell icon. Uh, we'll let you know whenever we have new videos available. And let's add share the channel to that that list of things to do. You know, if, if you're a comics fan, tell your buddies as well. Spread the word. It. Spread the word, man. We want to do some big things, man, when we hit 20,000. More, more on that later. And you can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below the video. You can sign up for our e-newsletter at the link below the video. Jim, I have to go work on my foreshortening, man. Can you give them their marching orders? Read more Kirby comics.